Hello everybody. Today we want to show you a very short example about how to use principal component analysis in order to get more information out of our data. And for this purpose, we selected a data file from an investigation we did with several colleagues in Vienna. It concerns particulate matter, which was precipitated by means of an impactor, and the sample we are looking at now was taken in Western Australia. When we look at the photo, which was taken by a scanning electron microscope, we see here high resolution photoparticles, typically the size of a few microns. We have different kinds of particles, and those particles were imaged by two microscopes. One was an energy dispersive X-ray, yielding information about the elements that make up the particles. When we move the cursor, then we get a spectrum, and each line in this spectrum shows the abundance of a certain element. For example, chlorine is in high abundance, and the same is true for sodium. So it is likely that this particle is sodium chloride. This is how we get information about the elements that make up the particles from the EDX, the energy dispersive X-ray. After that, the sample was observed through a Raman microscope. We can switch over to the Raman spectra now. If we move the cursor and go to different particles, then we see, for example, here, a typical spectra that indicates sodium nitrate. Now moving here, we have a particle which seems to be covered by some organic material, resulting in a carbon peak in the Raman image. And this peak is mainly due to the combustion of this organic material and the scanning laser, which yields carbon or soot. The interesting thing is now we have two spectra for each pixel, a Raman spectrum and an elemental spectrum, which is obtained by the energy dispersive X-ray. Now we can use these two kinds of spectra, combine them, and submit them to principal component analysis. We will start the PCA now. The PCA window requires, first of all, that we select the list of spectral descriptors. We prepared a few spectral descriptors for this data set. We see here in the caption of the descriptors that all of those descriptors are typically calibrated for a particular class or kind of substance. For example, this descriptor is calibrated for soot, or this descriptor is calibrated for titanium dioxide, and so on. All in all, we have defined 29 descriptors. And those descriptors are either the EDX lines, in other words, information about the elements that make up the particles, or they are some specific Raman lines or bands. Now let's apply the principal component analysis to this set of descriptors and to the data of this image. In order to scale the data, we choose to standardize it now. Then we click Calculate. We see here the scores plot, which has the scores of the first component and the scores of the second component. The most obvious thing is that we see a cluster of several points. This cluster is quite tight, so the question is, which part of the image is related to this cluster? In order to find this out, we can simply mark these data points by selecting this option, and then drawing a lasso around it. The data points are now marked here. They are indicated in red, and in the image they are also marked. What we see here is these data points are mostly at the edge of the image. If we look closely and put the cursor here, then we see in the EDX spectrum all of those data points are minus 1.1. And this is nothing other than a substitute value for indicating that there are some missing values. These missing values are due to a misalignment when measuring the sample in the energy dispersive X-ray and in the Raman microscope. Usually the sample is a little rotated and misaligned, and this is visible here in the form of pixels which have not been measured. During the creation of the data set, we created a pixel mask which exactly defines those empty pixels. 
we can select this missing data pixel mask. And when we remove the markings here, then we see that these violet or pink pixels indicate those pixels which do not have data or maybe only have partial data. And this mask will be used to exclude those pixels from the calculation. We select this mask and then recalculate the principal component analysis. Look at this cluster here. If we recalculate, then this cluster disappears. Let's try to plot the data, for example, here, using the second and the third principal component, or the third and the fourth. Then we can ask ourselves, which kind of particles is this one, or this one, or this one? If we are using analysis by means of PCA, then this is more or less an interactive approach. It is a kind of exploratory work with the data. We are trying different ideas. We are plotting the score plots or other plots, which we will show in a few moments. For example, if we plot the first against the second principal component, then we see a lot of pixels creating this arm. Now we can encircle these pixels and mark them. And if we look over to the picture, then we see all of those marked pixels are just one region here in the principal component plot. What could this mean? The interesting thing is in the case of the elemental composition, nothing is very spectacular, and so nobody could conclude anything from it. We can switch over to the Raman spectrum, and if we move the cursor here, then we see there are very distinctive bands. If we look at the Raman database, then we will find that this is titanium dioxide. We can conclude from this that there is one particle here which is clearly indicated by the Raman spectrum to be titanium dioxide. Playing with this approach might generate lots of work, but let's try once again. Let's encircle this arm of the diagram. We get a few spots. Now if we move the cursor, then we see that in each spot we get a very clear band which is nothing other than soot. This means that this arm in the score plot of the third and fourth principal component is soot, which was probably created by laser interaction during the Raman measurement. The question we can pose now is, is there a method to analyze the principal component data in a way that we can both group and find the particles that are similar? And there is one specific technique which has been described several times in the literature, and that is nothing other than hierarchical cluster analysis of the loadings of the principal component analysis. If we look at the loadings, then we see the loadings are an indication of the importance of the individual spectral descriptors. For example, we have here principal component 3, and there are a few high loadings and several loadings which are close to zero. And this loading is the titanium dioxide and it has a very low loading, which means in the third component, it has no meaning at all. It has no contribution. If we switch to the second, then we see first over here in this field, the name of the descriptor and second, that these four lines are particularly selective for titanium dioxide. This is an indication that the second principal component score plot will show us titanium dioxide. Let's have a look at it. We remove the markings and then switch over to the second PC and change the color scale in order to get a clear picture. If we change the color scale in a way that the high values are in red and low values are white, then we see that there is one spot remaining. And if we move the cursor, then we see in the Raman spectrum that exactly this point is titanium dioxide. The interesting question now is, how could we proceed in order to get an analysis of the different types of substances in parallel? without playing and fiddling around with all of those principal component scores. The solution is the hierarchical cluster analysis of the loadings. If we do this, then we can select the number of principal components which should be combined. 
and usually we use five to six. It depends on the scree plot, which displays the logarithm of the eigenvalues of the principal components. If we look at the scree plot, then we should use up to nine principal components because the first nine have an eigenvalue which is larger than one, and this contributes to the interpretation of the plot. Let's switch over to the HCA of the loadings. We can select different numbers of principal components. For example, if we use seven principal components, uh, this means that for seven components, we cover about 36% of the total information we see here. Then we get a very nice dendrogram. We can try not to activate parts of the dendrogram and reproject this part onto the image we will select this branch of the tree. All of the descriptors in this branch are titanium dioxide, otherwise we see here elemental information concerning titanium. If I click this and I adjust this color, then we have a bright spot here and this bright spot indicates titanium dioxide. The same is the case here where we have sodium and chlorine and the backscatter signal, which has no importance in this particular case though. But we see sodium and chlorine, and if we project this onto the image, then the white spots we get are sodium chloride particles. If we go down here to this branch of the dendrogram, then we have sodium nitrate. We have nitrogen and oxygen from the EDX, and the nitrate bands from the Raman spectra. And all of those together are an indication of particles that consist of sodium nitrate. We see here the sodium nitrate particles. If we select the soot, then we see the soot particles. We need to adjust the color scale. We see there are several soot particles on the substrate. Let's try the following. Let's start with the titanium dioxide and make them blue and adjust the color scale in such a way that there is a distinctive spot visible. Copy this image to the image stack, which means that we are projecting now this plot of the cluster analysis of the loadings onto the electron microscopic photo. We see this blue spot. This blue spot is actually this particle here. We will magnify it a little. We get a very strong signal in this region from titanium dioxide. This is a clear indication that this part actually consists of titanium dioxide. Let's combine this with the other particles. Let's have here sodium chloride and then change the color. Sodium chloride will be green. Next, let's put that on the image and the green particles are the sodium chloride particles. Let's have a look at the sodium nitrate. We will make them red. Put them onto the image, and we see again we have the red spots. Finally, we want to project soot as well. The soot will be yellow, and now put it onto the image. We see that we have different regions colored, indicating various kinds of particles. We have a yellow spot here or here, which means this particle was covered by possibly organic material that was burned during the processing of the Raman microscope. The result is, of course, carbon, which comes in the form of soot. If we go to the red spots, then we see that the red spots are the sodium nitrate particles. Again, the green ones are the sodium chloride particles, and the blue ones are the titanium dioxide. Finally, we could switch on all of those colors, and of course, we could introduce even more kinds of substances and then find those as well. If we look carefully, then we see still uncolored areas. So next, we could work on that and discover that there are other kinds of substances still contained in here. So that was a very quick introduction to using principal components. Let's sum up now what we have to do for principal component analysis. First, define our descriptors. 
and then load the descriptors. Apply the principal component analysis. And be sure to select the scaling and then calculate. If there are any missing data or if there are any pixels that we do not want to include in our calculations, then we select a pixel mask here, which we have to create using the pixel mask editor beforehand. And when we have calculated the principal components, then we can use, for example, the cluster analysis of the loadings in order to get further information of the constituents of our sample. And that was it. Please visit us again soon and stay tuned. Thank you for watching.